Every once in a while, I get a crazy lead on something I just have to follow up on. And a couple of days ago, Alex, my weapons expert, called to tell me he's got something I'm going to love lined up across the pond. But it's really super secret. So I hopped on a plane, and I'm here in London. Alex has a long-standing relationship with an antique arms and armor dealer here in London. And we're going to go in there. We're going to take a look. Maybe I'll buy something. Maybe I won't. But it's going to be a fun day. Rick, meet the finers. Um, Peter's the father. Rolly and Red also work with him, much like I work with my father. And in fact, Peter and my father have been friends for about 40 years. So I've known this family a long time. From the looks of it, you definitely have some incredible stuff here. If you follow through into our back room, some of the rarest pieces we have in our back room. So that's where you keep the good stuff. The better <laughs> stuff, yeah, yeah, yeah. Follow me. All right. The business is a family business which was started um, over 50 years ago by my father. Essentially, we deal in arms and armor from Roman and Greek times um, all the way through to the 19th century. We were excited when Alex called. We were very happy to, to see them. We certainly knew we had some pieces which um, might interest them. Oh, so this is where the real fancy stuff is at. A lot of the pieces here have um, fascinating provenance, some of which is royal. One of the pieces I'd like to show you guys is this pair of pistols here by John Christie. That is some crazy work. Made in Scottish style by a Scot, but made actually in his own private workshop in the Tower of London. George III commissioned John Christie to come down from Scotland to make dress pistols and such like for diplomatic gifts. You'd never fire anything like that. No, would, they weren't really designed to fire. They were designed to look good out of, in basically in formal wear, right? Although they were completely functional. Sure. No maker would ever make a pair of pistols, you know, unless they were purely mm -hmm. functional. Interestingly, they have a proof mark just here, which is actually the private Tower of London proof mark, which was mostly done for royal pieces. Okay. What are they made out of them? I'm assuming steel barrels? They're, what is the they're all steel, and then these are gilt brass stocks. Very unusual, very, very rare. They have a wonderful, grotesque face on the, on the bust of the pistols there. And all of this, is, how is all of this work done? Is this it is engraved? all engraved, chiseled and engraved, yeah. Can I pick one up? Yeah, sure. It makes you feel royal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's just amazing. And the style of these pistols is traditionally Scottish. It's purely Scottish. You don't find all steel pistols anywhere else, really, in the world. That is pretty incredible. What's that one right there, the ivory one? It's not ivory, no, that's staghorn. So this is um, made in 1600, and it's made for the Saxon court in Germany. It's one of only a few that have ever come onto the art market. This is a walnut stock that's inlaid with staghorn, and then the decoration is dogs and grotesque faces, chasing rabbits and so on. So that, that's a wheel lock? This is a wheel lock, about 1600 in date, yeah. And wheel locks typically are quite a bit bigger. They are. That's probably a, a half scale. So the, the purpose of making it smaller was probably for a boy or probably a Probably for a boy, yeah. Hey, check this thing out. It's beautiful. What's really interesting about the mechanism is you wind it, and this is a tightly wound spring that starts, once you let it go, it starts to spin, and there's a little door here. That door opens up and creates sparks. So the wheel's spinning, the pyrite's touching down on it, it goes and all the sparks come up, which lights the priming powder, which fires the gun. Extremely complicated. I incredibly complicated. How many did you say? Three? I no believe only three have ever come onto the art market. <laughs> yeah. So how much is the wheel lock? The wheel lock's 140,000 pounds. Okay. Um, I think I'll pass on this one, but how much are these? They're 100,000 pounds. 100,000 pounds? Yeah. And they tick all the boxes. They have a great name, or, you know, great maker, great condition. And, and they're beautiful, they're works of art. So would you take 80,000 pounds for them? No, Rick, I wouldn't, wouldn't take 80,000 pounds, but I would take 90,000 pounds for them. <sighs> would you take 85,000? That's like $105,000 American. I'll take 85,000 pounds, you have a deal. All right. All right. <laughs> 
just bought those. Oh well, yeah, I bought them. You just bought those. <laughs> I mean, they're fantastic. I'm thrilled. Well, thanks for bringing me here. They're absolutely amazing. Appreciate the business. Sweet. Thanks a lot. Cheers. All right. I shouldn't be in here any longer. I might buy something else. I might want to stay though. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm in Rome and I'm on a mission. Rebecca has told me about a rare bookstore here that might have a first edition of a book by Giordano Bruno, The Martyr of Science. I've been looking for one of his books for my entire life. He was a radical thinker whose theories threatened the Catholic Church. They ended up ordering all of his books destroyed, so only a few exist anywhere in the world. Giordano Bruno, he was the first one to say that the universe is infinite and the church did not like any of that. So in 1600, he was burnt at the stake right where I'm standing. He's been a hero of mine forever. So I'm going to the store, hopefully they have it and I can make a deal. If we do, this will be the greatest vacation of my life. Wow. Hello. Hi, I come to my bookshop. Hey, how's it going? Nice uh, to meet you. I was recommended to you by a friend of mine, so. Okay, we have okay. something interesting. My bookstore is a family business and is a bookshop since uh, 100 years. We find all our books in private collections, very well preserved uh, and very, very rare. What do you got? We can start uh, uh, an early edition of Machiavelli, The Prince. That'd be pretty amazing, yeah. Yeah. Oh, whoa. No. <laughs> uh, so what year is this? In, in Venice, 1544. This is pretty amazing. Every tyrant should read this. This is how you maintain your power. We still use the term in the States. Very Machiavellian. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so how much is something like this? Uh, 6,000 euros. Okay. That's pretty amazing. But the main reason I'm here is I heard you have a first edition Giordano Bruno. Yes. Maybe it's the best piece in my bookshop. <laughs> Can I see it? Sure. It's here, under key. <laughs> this is the Giordano Bruno. Ah, Giordano Bruno. The Giordano Bruno is a very, very rare first edition, printed in 1587. I think uh, there will be 50 copies known. This book is very, very rare. This is a beautiful edition. This is Latin. The progress of the hunter's lamp uh, of logical methods. Yeah. This is a small treatise. More on the logical method, the scientific method. Years and years, I've always wanted a book by him. This guy believed that the stars were suns and planets went around them. I mean, this was before telescopes he was coming up with this stuff. And this was forbidden knowledge. You know, he was going against the teachings of the Catholic Church. They ordered all of his books burnt. Yeah. And to be caught with one of these books, it was a really, really bad thing. They got rid of all the books and very, very few of them remained. The last one I saw the, of this that sold was like 1903? Yeah, 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 I found it, yeah. God, this is pretty amazing. All right, the big question. Yeah. How much do you want for it? You are American, so let's talk in dollar. 120,000. Um, I was thinking more like $80,000? No, I can't. I'm sorry. It's impossible like this. Um, I mean, what, what would be your best price? Let's do 110. It's the best I can do. You could, you could do 100,000. It's a small book. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I will give you $100,000 for it. Let's do this deal. All right, um, $100,000. Um, $100,000. This has been an amazing day. I am going to go get the wire transfer figured out. I would shop more, but I don't have any more money to spend. <laughs> it's been an amazing day. I paid a lot for it, but I don't care. This has been something I've been looking for for years. And now I'm going to have a glass of Italian wine and celebrate. So I've been in London on a business trip. It's been great. I figured I'm gonna go check out the English countryside. But then I got a tip on a guy selling some classic British sports cars. So 
Rick being Rick, I had to go check him out. Good afternoon and uh, welcome to Robin Hood Country. My name's Peter. Hi, I'm Rick. Name? Yeah, I had a friend tell me you have some cars for sale. Well, I don't know whether they're for sale, but you can have a look at them by all means. <laughs> I have a really good friend in America who actually knows Rick quite well. My friend said, could he come and look at my collection? And obviously, I'd be delighted to assist. I've been uh, collecting cars now for about uh, 35 years. The epicenter of my collection is iconic English classics. I have three cars today I'd like to show to Rick. I have an Aston Martin DB6, similar to the James Bond car in silver. And then I have another Aston Martin DB6 in Giovanni Rosso, beautiful color. I also have a Jaguar V12 E-Type. I think Rick will be smitten with all three. Let's see what happens. That is pretty. This is Aston Martin DB6, four liter overhead cam, 1966. Very, very rare car. That's amazing. What's that one? That one is its bigger brother. This is another DB6. It's uh, two years later. It's a uh, 68 overhead cam, four liter. All right. Oh, it's a beautiful car. I love Aston Martins. I think they're super cool. They have those English lines that no other car has. And, um, you know, it's what James Bond used to drive. Absolutely. It's just quintessentially English. The company was formed by a guy called David Brown, hence the Unique number plate here, DB205. He wanted to win at Le Mans, so he decided to build the best car he possibly could. And all these models are all derivatives from the racing heritage. Did he win at Le Mans? He won at Le Mans. But, you know, if you're a special agent in your 007, you've got to have the fastest car on the block. And that's what James Bond had, you know, after David Brown won at Le Mans. So what's this right here? This is another English classic. This is a Jaguar E-Type. This is the granddaddy of them all. Yeah. You know, this is the one to have. And then if you notice, we've got on here ENZ, uh, which is a homage to Enzo Ferrari, because Jaguar wanted to beat Ferrari at Le Mans, and then they did. Enzo said this was the most beautiful car in the world. He's on record as saying that. But it's a beautiful car. So if we were to sell it, what would the dollar figure be? Well, I've never really considered it. And it would actually break my heart to sell it, but um, we're talking $400,000. Can we take it for a spin? Yeah, let's take it for a ride and uh, see if you actually like the car before you depart with those famous dollars. <laughs> OK, sounds like a plan. I just got to figure out how to drive this thing. OK, well, don't forget, we're on the right-hand side, but I'll be with you all the way. OK, now you're going to go right here. That's how my kids must feel when I teach them how to drive. <laughs> this car is quintessential British workmanship at its finest. Not only is it beautiful, it drives like a dream. It does drive shockingly well for a 60s car. Oh, it's just amazing, isn't it? It's just no, it, amazing. it really is. This is incredible. So what do you think, Rick? I think it's the smoothest 1960s car I have ever driven in my life. And it absolutely terrifies me because everything is backwards. <laughs> yeah, you were driving on the wrong side of the road. I, I, I love it, but I don't think I could ever get used to it. <laughs> but it's a British iconic classic, isn't it? I, I knew you'd like it. <laughs> well, thank you for letting me drive it. It's a beautiful car, but it just won't work for me. OK, well, it, it's perfectly understandable. But I do have something you may be interested in. OK. The guy who owned this car was so special in your history and our history. This is what I wanted to show you. I've had it for 25 years, and every year I said I'm going to restore it. It hasn't been revealed in years. And here you go. So this is? This is Winston Churchill's car. Are you kidding me? Well, this is an Austin Westminster. Westminster after the Westminster Palace, where Winston gave most of his famous speeches. I got it in an auction 25 years ago. I've just never had the time to restore it. This is super cool. Yeah, he was one of the most incredible guys in history. I Absolutely. Mean, the UK wouldn't be the UK without him. He is, I wouldn't say single-handedly won the Second World War, but if without him, it would be a much different world right now. When times were worst, he would get on the radio and explain that in the end it will be better, we just have to stick together as a nation. Absolutely. I um, don't think we'll ever have a leader like him again. We ne never ever will. A bit special. This is the car he was driven around in. 
He was chauffeur driven, sat in the front. And on the side there, you can actually see on the top of the dash, big cigar burn where he had his cigars. That's pretty cool. I mean, I love it, but this should definitely stay in, stay in the UK. It's sort of be like taking Abraham Lincoln stuff out of the States. No, it just shouldn't be done. But you really should restore it. Oh, yeah. There's cars that were owned by presidents and prime ministers, and then there's Winston Churchill. Yeah. I mean, it would be the equivalent of Roosevelt's. Oh, yeah, it'd be right up there, wouldn't it? I just want to thank you. This has been an absolutely amazing day. Thanks for sharing this with me. My pleasure, Rick. Yeah. Okay. okay. And it's only getting it uncovered. You've stimulated me. I will get it done this year. Okay. I will get it restored. <laughs> I just landed in London for my much needed vacation, and I'm just waiting for my buddy Big Mark to pick me up. He owns a pawn shop a couple hours away. Now I'm headed out to the city of Chester to check out my buddy's pawn shop. Hey guys, what's up? Hey, <laughs> long time no see. You too. <laughs> this is little Mark. Hello. Hi, mate. Good to meet you. How's it going? Good, good. So this is it, huh? Yeah, that's it, mate. This is the uh, little shop. It looked quite English shop, you know. OK, well, show me around. You know, let's have a look around. I've known Rick for about five years. Um, we met at the coin show in Las Vegas. Been friends ever since. I mean, his pawn shop's good, but it's American at the end of the day. He's got 200 years of history. We've got 2,000 years of history. He's got nothing compared to us. Now, I've got something here that will blow your socks off. OK. This is what you've been looking for all your life. All right. Ready? Ready. Really? I'm ready. Wow. It's absolutely beautiful. What is it? <laughs> well, you think it's a piece of rusty metal, don't you? Well, it is a piece of rusty metal. Remember that really famous ship that would never sink? Oh, the Titanic. That's it. That's part of the Titanic's hull. So is this where it ran into the iceberg? Or? No, the opposite side. The good side. All right. They sent down the, the little submarine and it broke off a piece, or? It was the massive operation. They sent down several submarines. They broke off the big piece, which is 20 tons, and brought it up. And then from the big piece, they took these samples off. So got all the paperwork for it. Not many people have touched that. That's amazing, isn't it, really? That is amazing. And it's amazing how much it's worth, because you just can't get it. So is it for sale? Everything's for sale, mate. You know that. I'll sell anything. How much you want for it? This, this is a gem. I've had an offer on this a few days ago. If you can beat it, you can buy it off me. How much? How much do you reckon? That's a number I have no idea on. I just don't. I mean, I've never... This... I've never tried to research a piece of the Titanic. That is going to cost you 1.2 million pounds. <laughs> yeah. If you can make anything over 1.2 million, that's, a, that's my offer I've had the two days ago, 1.2 million pounds. If you can beat that, it's yours, mate. Okay, so what else do you have? <laughs> <laughs> what point? Come on, that's a good piece. Imagine breaking it up into several pieces and putting it into frames and, and stuff. You'll make a fortune out of that. Um, out of my price range. What do you got in, like, rock and roll stuff? All I know is I'm not dropping 1.2 million pounds on a chunk of metal, unless it's a really big chunk of gold. <laughs> I know you're a massive Elton John fan. I am an Elton John fan, yeah. Elton John boots? These are original Elton John boots as worn by him, that would suit you, sir. Those are actually pretty cool. Listen, listen, hang on, let's just stop there. Do you think all the cool stuff's in Vegas? We've got the Beatles, we've got Queen. We made the Beatles big. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but we've got the Who, we've got, we've got Rolling Stones, we're cool, man. We got Elvis. Uh-huh. And Johnny Cash. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Elton John's so famous, he really is one of the stars of glam rock. He was one of the guys who started the 70s off with a kick. They're cool boots, they're fantastic, and I think they will look good on Rick. All the providences with them, everything. When did he wear them? I believe early 70s. You know, Goodbye Yellow Bit Road, um, Rocket Man. Crocodile Rock? Yeah. He wore them in that phase of his life with the big glasses, you know, and the big collars, the big flary trousers. Elton John is right up there with David Bowie, The Who, The Kinks. I mean, he was a massive major player in the 70s. He was one of the few people that could actually sell out a stadium. They would actually look good in Vegas. That's a Vegas thing, isn't it? Um, yeah. How much you want for them? 1,700 pounds. 1,700 pounds. Well, I'll give you a discount, because you're friends, so we'll do it for 1,600. 
I'll give you a thousand pounds for him. <laughs> you stop the jet lag. Uh, no, you, you jet lag now, <laughs> are you? <laughs> you know, I'm gonna have to pay to ship him home. You know, I love you, Rick, but you are a <laughs> sometimes when it comes to money. <laughs> I mean, what's your best price, Tom? Listen, we've known each other for a long time. One thousand four hundred pounds. Right. And you know that's a bargain, man. So it's a deal. Twelve hundred pounds. Whoa! Uh, One thousand four hundred pounds. Maybe in the middle. One thousand three hundred and fifty. One thousand three hundred pounds. One thousand three hundred fifty. One thousand three hundred pounds. One thousand three hundred twenty-five, and that's the last thing. Last. You can do it. Thirteen twenty-five. Yeah. Thirteen twenty-five. Come on. All right. Big Mark is the typical pawnbroker. Of course, he's going to start high, but I'm not going to pay that because if I get him, I'm going to get him for a deal because I'm a pawnbroker, a better one. <laughs> I've been dreaming about taking a European vacation for a long time. And finally, Rick and I made it to Italy. There's so many things I want to do here, but as always, it's business before pleasure. Back in Vegas, I bought a skull cap worn by a pope known as Zacchetto. Part of this trip is to prove to Rick that I made a good purchase, but the other part is so I could have a Roman holiday. All right, Rick, I know you're sick of walking around the city, so I got you a van on your company car, don't worry. And we're gonna go get this Zacchetto checked out. You're gonna be really proud of me once you realize how well I did. This wasn't a lot of money, was it? I don't know, I put it on your credit card. So this Zucchetto inspired Chum for this Roman holiday. He paid over $3,000 for it. He did not get it authenticated or anything. And apparently, he has found someone who can authenticate it. So we'll see what happens. All right, Rick, you're about to see the reason we came here. Father Josh. Chum Lee, how are you? I'm great. Thanks for meeting me today. Glad to meet with you. How's it going? I'm Rick. Father Josh, good seeing you. Welcome to the Eternal City. I'm Father Joshua Rodrig. I'm assistant professor of theology at the Pontifical Gregorian University and the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross. I received a phone call from Chum Lee, and he has an item belonging to Pope Pius XII, and so he wanted me to meet up with him today here in Rome to authenticate that item. You know, I called you down because yes. I wanted you to look at this uh, zucchetto. Okay. Do you know what a zucchetto is? I was told it was a zucchini. <laughs> yes, that's, well, you know, you're not too far from, from the mark. The zucchetta, the name zucchetta comes from actually the word zucca, which is Italian for pumpkin. And you can sort of see that it looks like the top of a pumpkin. And it comes from the early times when they had what was called tonsuring, which was they cut a piece of hair off the top of the head. Think of like the friar tuck look. Okay. And so it was mainly to protect the shaved head from the elements. We don't do that anymore unless some of us are blessed with a natural tonsure. I feel that, yeah. The reason he wears his hat. <laughs> That's why hats are there, <laughs> protect us. What was Pope Pius XII known for? Well, he was really known as uh, the Pope during World War II. Uh, he came in to his pontificate in 1939, so all during World War II, he was sort of holding things together, really, in Rome. Okay, so was that Pope Pius XII's Zucchetto. Wait a second, I have this letter here. Well, no, this is, uh, it's from the Anticamera Pontificia. Essentially, it's the papal chambers, and it's signed by the Cameriere Segreto Participante, which translates into the participating secret waiter. This isn't the guy that's gonna bring, you know, pasta to the Pope and all that. <laughs> so he would be the one that would wait with dignitaries that were coming to meet the Pope. So the document is, is correct. Okay. And the, uh, the zucchetto itself, usually you can tell by the type of cloth that's used is sort of a watered silk. And usually you'd find that with the Holy Father. And so um, no doubt that this would belong to Pope Pius XII. That's good news. We got an amazing zucchetto from Pope Pius XII himself. Okay, pretty amazing. Do you know how much this would be worth? Well, normally with relics, we don't, we don't sell relics because of you know just the sacred value of it. However, after you had called, I had done some research to look and see what, you know, you would find in an auction. And Sirius Pope Pius XII, more or less $3,500. Okay. Well, you heard the man. Father says this is a holy relic. It's worth more than I paid for it, but I don't think we're going to be able to sell this, Rick. I think we're going to have to put this on display in our shop. <laughs> I really appreciate the right? trouble you coming out and everything No like problem. That. All right. Thank you, Father. Um, 
Good seeing y'all. Yeah. Enjoy the rest of the city. If you get to Vegas, come and see us. <laughs> I'll go for the buffets. <laughs> Vegas is no place for a father. Maybe Chum did purchase this for the right price, but I would suggest that he maybe keep it with him and maybe let Pope Pius XII intercession sort of help him out throughout life. This is cool. You know anything about maps? Uh, they're old. <laughs> That's about it. I don't use them. I use my maps on the phone. So. <laughs> Marco seems like a really good kid, but I feel like I'm on vacation and I'm babysitting. <laughs> Do you have any maps of, like, uh, I'm from Las Vegas. Any, any maps of the states or western United States? We do, yeah. The New World Americas are upstairs. OK, let's go take a look. What people like about the maps is that they're rare, important documents. Basically, it's ink and paper, but it's the story that, that the map tells and that we can tell with it. OK, let me start you out with the local maps first, um, show you a rare and interesting map of the Nevada Territory, as it was known. It relates to the discovery of silver in the United States. They make Nevada its own territory in 1861, and this map is from 1862. It was very important because it was in the middle of the American Civil War when this was happening, and um, both sides wanted all the silver, and they ended up going with the Union, and it really worked out. Well, it's a rare piece, yeah. This is really cool. I mean, do you have any other stuff like Nevada? Or? Well, I'll follow up with the map that we have of Las Vegas, your part of the state. It's in relation to land development, published around about 1920. So is your pawn shop on the map anywhere? Um, as a matter of fact, it is. It would be, those would be my lots right there. I'm absolutely amazed that these maps are in London. How they got here, I have no idea, but it's pretty damn cool. I'll show you this. It is a map of North America from the Dutch Golden Age, the most famous and celebrated period of map making. This is, in fact, the only map of North America from the Dutch Golden Age. It's around about 1650. It shows the famous myth of California as an island. Well, California's not an island, is it? Um, no, it's not an island. It was, uh, it was basically a mistake. The theory is someone went all the way up the coast, saw the inlet near Washington, and says, yeah. obviously, it's an island. Oh. A map of North America from 1650 is just too rare to pass up. I will probably never see another one of these in my lifetime. So how much are they? The map of Las Vegas, a very rare piece, even though it's actually less than 100 years old. Well, it's 1,450 pounds. OK. And then the Nevada Territory, well, that one is 795 pounds. The older one, naturally, is the more expensive one. It's also the more important as such for the history of map making. That one is 5,950 pounds. All right, um, so do you guys negotiate any? We don't. Um, we're a gallery, and these are fixed prices, so no. You, you should do some type of deal if you're spending so much money. Five grand for one map, it's a lot of money. Yeah, but it's 350 years old, and it's an incredibly important map. You can ship them, right? Yeah, of course we can, yeah. You, and you'll throw in shipping, right? Throw it in. We might be able to work that out. OK, at least I get something out of you. Um, it's really hard to find maps like this. So let me let me get the Dutch map and the map of the Nevada Territory. Fantastic. OK, all right, we got a deal. OK, follow me, and we'll sort out the paperwork. OK. This whole non-negotiation stuff is <laughs> The two maps I did buy, I don't know if I'm going to resell them or keep them, but I think I got really good deals on them. Go on, you're happy. You're happy you're in England. Go on, smile. Hey, man, what's up? Hey, man, how are you? Oh, pretty good. Good to see you. So what is the secret squirrel stuff? So, all right. <laughs> you know how every time you get a gun, you call me in, and if it has a proof mark on it, you like to talk about the history of proofing? Yeah. So this place right here is the proof house of the gun makers company of the city of London. This is where they test all the gun barrels ever made in this area. That is cool. I happen to know the guy who runs it, and I asked him to give us a little demonstration and tour. That's cool. So let's go get out of cold. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Hi, Rich. Hi. Hey, this is my friend Rick. Hey, how's it going? Good to meet you. Please come in. Uh, I'll leave the wife. Come in. 
OK, so this is where it's all done? This is where the action happens. It's where we've been testing guns since 1673. My name's Richard Mabbitt, and I'm the proof master of the worshipful company of gun makers, the London Proof House. The proof master oversees the testing of all firearms that are sold or offered for sale within the UK. The company was formed in 1637 under King Charles I, and effectively it was a way of overseeing the quality and the safety of all the arms being produced in London at that time. So every firearm that's made in the UK comes to a proof house first? The legal requirement, before it can be sold or even offered for sale, it comes through the proof house, including military arms you'd be interested to know. In the process of proofing a barrel, has it changed much in 300 years? Very, very little has changed. We still go through exactly the same procedure where we're inspecting the firearms and then testing them with an overpressured cartridge to ensure they're safe for the end user. Well, I was hoping that we might be able to watch your process and show Rick like how it's done. Absolutely no problem at all. And please follow me down. Okay. Okay, so we've already got a gun set up. It's one of the best English guns. What gun is it? It's a uh, Purdy. So we'll go through and you gentlemen can fire it. We'll then bring it out, we'll inspect it to ensure there's been no material change, and then we'll mark the gun up by the traditional hand stamps, the old methods. Great. Okay. All right, let's, let's go fire this thing. OK, so if you'd like to grab some ear defenders, okay. we'll go in. I'll go in, make sure the gun is set up, take the safety mechanism off, and then we can fire it. OK. OK, that's all set up, ready to fire. Everything we do here is fired remotely. Because we're here to see if a firearm will fail, the last place you want to be is in the room with it. So it's fired by a simple piece of string. So ear defenders on, and we'll fire the gun. OK, please. Now successfully proof tested again. Congratulations. I didn't expect that. I didn't either. I thought, that was... I thought we'd be a little soundproof I can or something. Feel that. Okay, so that's all fired. So what we'll do now, we'll go back through to the workshop, we'll reinspect it, and then if we're happy, we'll mark it. Okay. Now we're going to clean it, we'll rod it through, we'll give a quick inspection of the barrel. If we're happy it's still straight, there's been no material change, we'll go ahead and mark the barrel. OK, I bet you use this. Absolutely. Mark one cleaning rod. <laughs> Especially with black powder, you got to get that stuff out. That's a black powder shotgun? OK, those balls should be nice and clean. We'll have a quick view down the barrel, using nothing more technical than mark one eyeball. You know what? <laughs> Everything seems to be in order there, so we'll go ahead and mark it. So what, what, what marks do you put on it? We'll have a date at the bottom, so the LP over a two-digit date code. So is LP stand for London Proof? Yes, it does. We'll then have the bore diameters and the chamber length. We'll have the calibre of the arm, and then because it's an over and under, we'll mark the letters O and U so we know which barrel the dimensions relate to. We could use modern engraving methods. It's almost too neat. So we use the traditional, slightly wonky hand stamps. <laughs> So here we can see the finish marks. Oh wow! Thank you very much. This is a great Thank day. You. Thank you. Absolute pleasure. Thanks ever so much. We got to shoot guns in the middle of London. No one gets to do that. Exactly. Unless you're a criminal. Or this guy. <laughs>